Good morning and welcome to today's session, Business Finance in the Context of COVID-19. Thanks as ever to our main sponsor, Tunnox, and also to our partners for business, Cumberland Business, Bruce Stevenson, DM Hall, Discover Scotland, Interhome, Noise Aware, Quality and Tourism, Super Control and Verbo, and of course, one of our valued trade supplier plus, EQ Accountants. So, funding your self-catering property investment, what's changed in the context of COVID-19? I'm delighted to welcome Grant Seaton, Senior Business Lending Manager at The Cumberland, specialising in self-catering and hospitality mortgages and long-term friend of the ASSC. Scott Gregg is a partner at EQ Accountants and head of EQ Leisure, who act for a large variety of leisure clients, including many self-catering businesses. Scott and the team have provided assistance throughout the ongoing crisis, helping clients secure funding to boost cash flow and continuing to support them as their businesses reopen to customers. Welcome to you both. And um, to start off with, I'd like to introduce Grant. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you for asking us to, to come today to, to speak. No problem. I'll let you enjoy. Right. I will now try and share my screen. Can you see that, Fiona? Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so as I say, thank you very much for inviting me along today um, to, to run through what what has changed um, within the industry with regards to lending at this time. Um, I'd like to take you through some areas um, of what has changed. We are obviously going to cover off what's happened when you when you are looking to try and obtain finance for your self catering property at this point in time. How best to prepare for those discussions if you are looking for finance, but not just that, also with any discussions that you are having with your financial organisation then go on to talk a little bit about the FCA guidance on COVID forbearance. Um, obviously, due to the, the new national lockdown in England, there has been some new guidance given in that area. And then finally, just some hints and tips of when you are dealing with your financial organisation, what you may want to do. Um, and then happy to obviously answer any questions that come from, from any of the viewers. So, are mortgages for self-catering properties available right now? And the short answer to that is yes, they are. Um, what you might find is a bit more difficulty in finding what you maybe are looking for. There is potentially a lot more information to sift through. Um, there are more providers, surprisingly. Um, and you may wonder, well, why is that? Um, there has become more mutual regional building sites have come into the marketplace over the last six to nine months, um, primarily because they've lost um, some other niche areas, typically buy-to-let lending has been less for them. So they've looked for other niche lending and holiday let is seen to be an area of self-care and lending. It seems to be an area that they could um, look to offer something. Now, what that has meant is um, an abundance of people into the marketplace. However, some of them, because they're quite small operators, haven't had the capacity to deal with high volumes of applications coming through. And again, it might surprise some of you, um, but holiday let lending has hit an absolute boom over the last three to four months. A lot of people have seen the rise of staycations, um, albeit there's, with the backdrop of lockdowns, um, happening, they are still seeing the long-term prospect of an investment into self-catering as a positive one. So there has been high volumes of inquiries coming through to lenders, high levels of applications coming in as well, which has meant that you might see a, a lender in the marketplace one week and then go on the next week. Um, and it may only be for an interim period while they, they clear the backlog, but how annoying for anybody who's earmarked a company um, as somebody they want to make an application with and then the next day they're gone. Um, so that's just something to look out for. Rates have become a little higher in, in the marketplace at the moment. Um, and again, you would normally see if there was a lot of competition in there that it would start to push the prices down. However, however it is a balance between 
and um, what is the perceived risk at the moment of lending, and especially when there's lockdown still on the horizon at times. Um, I think longer term, you might start to see the rates come back down again. Um, as I say, we've probably gone from six or seven lenders in the marketplace to upwards of 20 now. So ultimately, over time, with the, the supply of mortgage products out there, I think you'll start to see the rates start to come down, but maybe not for over the short term. Loan to values have been restricted on occasions. Uh, at the Cumberland, we actually pulled back to 60% maximum on loan to values for a period of time there. We have returned back to 75% now, um, and typically 75% is the, the maximum loan to value that you will find out in the marketplace. The last thing I've touched on there is a broker relationship. It's not for everybody, um, but if I go back to the first point there, which is you may find there's a lot of information to sift through to get to where you want to be. Sometimes a broker will have that intelligence. They'll know what's happening in, in the marketplace, who's open for lending and who's not. It will cost you, though, if you were going to use a broker to go and seek finance for you. They'll charge you for their um, contacts, for their relationship, but they should be bringing um, sort of dealing with a lot of the paperwork and everything for you. So there is some benefits as well. So how best to prepare for those discussions when you go to financial organisation? And I should stress on this, this is not just to do with new borrowing or any further borrowing you want. This is also for financial support, um, also known as forbearance. What you really need to prepare is evidence of what your business was delivering before COVID hit. Um, so how, how successful it's been, and typically you will have some form of financial accounts, either tax returns, if you're dealing with an agency, there's likely to be invoices that you could provide, and then there's bank statements as well. So you should have a whole host of documentation which can show what your business was doing pre-COVID. Then evidence of what's happened during the time of COVID hitting, um, and information along, along the lines of cancellations, what happened was with the people that rebooked into future months. Um, again, you'll have your bank statements, agents' invoices, and your own management information you keep. If you don't keep management information, I would encourage you to do so, and it can even just be a simple spreadsheet. And then what are evidence have you got of bookings looking going forward? Um, I guess that's just a discussion to have with any financial organisation, just to, to explain what you have got booking forward. And of those ones that are booked into the forward, how many of those were cancellations which have rebooked, um, or how buoyant is the future um, dates looking? So looking at sort of Easter time into summer of next year as well. And having all this information at hand just gives the confidence to the lender um, that you know where you sit with things, and um, you're all over your figures, and that just gives confidence when it comes to making the decision on both lending but also in any forbearance decisions as well. FCA guidance on COVID forbearance. Um, there's obviously been support offered to people through payment holidays, and that's been classed as COVID forbearance. The latest on that is that they are going to extend out the period that you can apply for COVID forbearance to the end of January next year. And the rules currently, which are in consultation, so these are still got to be finalised, are that you could have up to six months payment holiday, and that is without it being marked against your, your credit file. After that period of six months, you can still apply for forbearance, but it would be classed as business as usual forbearance, which would then be marked against your credit file going forward. You've really got to consider how that will then look in the market going forward. So if you are then looking to refinance another lender, or if you are going for any form of credit at all, I would like to think that providing you've got all that evidence of what you've done and the impact that COVID's had on you and your plans to get back out of there, if this was the only option to you, I would like to think that financial organisations will take that into consideration um, even if it does come up on your credit file going forward. I know as an organisation, that will be something we will look at and consider um, on its merits when it comes to that time of any credit um, applications coming forward to us. Um, but that is typically where we're going to be looking, um, or that's what 
the FCA are likely to confirm over the next week or so. So it's six months full um, payment holiday without it being referenced on the credit agency. But after that, it would be business as usual, credit forbearance with it marked against your credit file. And the final slide I've got is just a couple of just hints and tips with dealing with financial organisation. For me, communication is key. And um, so if you if you're looking at your cash position, if you're looking at the bookings ahead and think and this is not adding up, communicate with your lender at the earliest possibility. Um, if you're discussing matters over the phone, these should be recorded telephone calls from from the organization you're dealing with. So take just some details against the date and time that you have spoken to your lender. Uh, it might be useful to refer back to in the future, and they should be able to get copies of calls if you needed them at any time. Also ask for an email or written confirmation of the discussion that's taken place, especially if there's a material decision that has been made during that call. Um, they should be confirming things back to you anyway, but there's no harm in asking for that. And then finally, just maintain good records of that communication, whether it be over the phone, email, um, or if you get letters, who obviously keep keep a file of those as well. And it just gives you um, everything that you would require if you ever need to, um, you know, go back to an ombudsman for any decision on there. Not that we're wishing that upon anybody, but it's always just worthwhile keeping that information. So I guess the, the recap for me is. Yes, we are lending. The industry is still lending. It might be a more difficult path to, um, to get through. There are people there to help. Um, and if it is not lending, but forbearance you're looking at, communication is certainly the key. So I'll say Thanks thank so you. Much. Thank you, Grant. That's brilliant. And I think, yeah, that's exactly the takeaway from today is that communication is key. Your lender is there to support you. Um, and the more communication you have with them, the better. And I suppose that's exactly the same with your accountancy firm. They are there to support you and um, help you through this crisis. I'd like to welcome Scott just now. And just to mention, if you've got any questions, please pop them into the questions box on the right hand side of your screen, because we will come back um, at the end and, and offer an opportunity to answer the questions. Scott, welcome. Thank you very much, Fiona, and welcome to everyone. Uh, first, I just want to thank um, ourselves at EQ for being invited to present here um, on a topic that is constantly changing. Um, and I'm going to be hopefully highlighting some of the key tax changes um, from uh, an income tax, capital gains tax perspective that we need to be considering in the context of COVID um, because there has been a raft of changes and I, I don't think we've probably seen the last of them yet. Um, so I'll, everything hopefully today is, is, is accurate as today's date, but uh, as always, um, it's a, an ever changing environment. The things I'll be looking at today um, will cover sort of the three, the main taxes um, that will be of interest to, to the self catering community. Income tax, um, as well as a bit of corporation tax there, capital gains tax, VAT, um, and then just a brief overview of the COVID support that has been um, made available to the sector. and what the impact of that will look like in the current year and next year um, from a, a taxation perspective um, and on accounts. Uh, I'll try and keep it brief um, to stick to times and obviously questions will come after. So looking at income tax, the majority of, of, of self-catering, holiday-like accommodation businesses um, from the most part are operated as sole trades or, or sort of family partnerships or husband and wife partnerships with the underlying profits being exposed to income tax um, versus if the trade is run through a company and um, those underlying profits are exposed to corporation tax. One of the, the main drivers therefore will be income tax measures um, and the, how, to, how to finance those payments when income tax is based on previous year's profits. Um, 
one of the main things the, the government undertook was the deferral of the second payment on account, which would have been due on 31st of July 20. They, they realised that cash was, was were short and businesses were, were hemorrhaging cash and, and offering refunds. So they deferred that payment initially to the 31st of January 21. Just recently, um, they've changed that yet again to allow the full tax bill that would have been paid on the 31st of January 21 to allow that to be paid over 12 months, subject to a few criteria, um, interest free. So essentially that could mean that tax bills that would have been paid by July 20 to actually be settled by at the latest January 22. Um, that time to pay facility uh, will be agreed between the taxpayer and, and HMRC um, with agents being involved if required um, and say they're subject to, to certain limits being in place in terms of the overall tax bill. But that could be quite crucial um, because a lot of the immediate support was the deferral of, of tax and therefore a lot of businesses could find themselves in a position of having substantial tax bills um, at the back end, which without this um, time to pay facility could have meant um, struggle to settle them in time. The other major um, support mechanism that was, was put in place was for the self-employed, which if you're a sole trade or a partnership, you'll be deemed to be self-employed. Um, and there was a support grant made available. Um, however, for the most part, it was only for trading businesses. Um, depending on how your business is, is structured, if it's purely just down as rental income on your tax return um, in, your, in the land and property pages, you wouldn't have been eligible for the initial 80% of your average three month profits as a grant. Um, that was due to come to an end at the same time as the furlough scheme. Um, but following uh, the announcement uh, a week ago, that has now been extended through to March 21 as well. Um, however, as I mentioned, that's not directly related to rental income, if that's how it's been reported. Those grants, um, or I shouldn't say grants, those, those support mechanisms are taxable as income um, and will need to be returned on the relevant pages of the tax return next year. Larger furnished holiday light businesses, guest house businesses, which operate as a trade and are returned as such, and by that they also offer ancillary services. Um, by being as a trade, they would have been eligible potentially for the self-employed income support grant. And again, tax will the same mechanism. Another sort of tax planning opportunity will be to look at reducing payments on account for the current tax year. Um, which the first one would have been due in January 21. Payments on account are nothing more than an advanced payment on estimated profits, um, normally based on the previous year. However, uh, nothing's uh, normal right now, so it'd be a good opportunity to review those payments on account um, and reduce them accordingly, but document evidence as to why you reduce them. If you reduce them too much, the revenue will charge interest um, when you actually come to settle up. So take the time, again, or I'll touch on it, management information will help ascertain what profits may be, and you could look at reducing those to save cash flow, cash better in your pocket than unnecessarily in the revenues right now. Moving on, looking, looking at capital gains tax, there's been a few changes that have been um, within the, the budget to come into force, especially this tax year, which have gone a little bit under the radar because of, of, of COVID, but given the, the rental sector um, and a lot of financial businesses, there's some significant changes that I just wanted to touch on. Um, the main one is a new reporting regime for the sale of residential property, which gives rise to a capital gains tax charge. Any transaction from the 6th of April that falls into this category must be reported and tax paid within 30 days of completion. As you'll see in the slide there, that, that massively accelerates the payment of tax to the re uh, revenue and customs. Uh, as an example there, property sold on, on the 6th of April this year would have to report and pay capital gains tax by the 6th of May 20, where under the old system, that same transaction 
you would have had 21 months to report and pay that capital gains tax. That's as an extreme, but as anyone will appreciate, trying to report and pay tax 30 days after completion uh, is quite tight. Um, and we're now into the point where the revenue will apply penalties and interest for non-compliance. The other issue with the reporting is it's not as straightforward as uh, you may like. Clients have to set up personal tax accounts, uh, register the agent to submit the tax returns on their behalf. So it's a little bit cumbersome and it needs to be thought about in advance of, of, of selling a property. Um, the capital gains tax position will be estimated initially because you'll be reporting during a tax year, which the overall outcome is not known, especially as capital gains tax rates interact with other levels of taxable income. So essentially what you're paying is, a, is an estimated payment or a payment on account in relation to that. And when it's reported on the final tax return in the year, and the tax is known, a credit will be applied for the tax paid in advance. If the taxes that was paid was too much, you'll get repayment. If it's too little, you'll pay a balance in relation to that. So it's, it's quite a fundamental change from the old regime. Um, and some things sort of solicitors are, I believe, not buying clients about, but they won't be taking any part in the reporting. The other one to touch on is the restriction on lettings relief from again the 6th of April this year, lettings relief was a, a really useful relief which up to a maximum of £40,000 of again could be relieved against uh, tax subject to the relevant conditions. However, they've now restricted that relief so it only applies when the property is in effect in shared occupation between the owner and the tenant, not when the property is let solely to the tenant. This could have some big effects. Um, certainly had a, a number of clients that decided to sell properties in the previous tax year um, because the lettings relief was significant and, and by losing that, they would almost feel trapped into keeping the property, um, which in conjunction with other changes to income tax, they didn't want to do. So bear that in mind, if you've previously lived in the property as a main residence and then subsequently let it out, Normally that would have qualified, not any more, um, only periods of shared occupation. And just to reiterate, the, the capital gains tax rates applicable to residential property sales is still 28%, um, which is a rate and it's to itself, all other assets, be it shares um, or land, are subject to rates between 10 and 20%. Um, so there has been a target approach at the let property, residential property market um, with a higher rate of tax. And as I'll touch on towards the end, there's ever, every chance that rate may go up. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on the change to what was known as entrepreneur's relief. You may have heard of that. Um, it's sort of been rebranded as business asset disposal relief. And it would apply for the disposal of furnished holiday let businesses and, and properties used within the furnished holiday let business um, subject to proper tax planning. And that could allow for a tax rate of 10% when you come to sell that business or the property um, up to £1 million of gains per person. Um, previously, that £1 million limit um, was £10 million back in February, but um, at the latest budget, they slashed it down to 1 million um, and tightened up who can qualify, um, which is a little bit of a, I think a standard that we've seen going forward. However, it's not to be overlooked. It can be very valuable. It'll save 100,000 pounds of tax or potentially 180,000 pounds of tax per person if they can structure the affairs so they can qualify for it. Moving on, um, I'll touch briefly on VAT, however, I do appreciate a lot of, sort of the smaller end self-catering furniture holiday businesses are not that registered. Um, to remain competitive, they're structured that way to keep income below the VAT threshold um, to avoid having to register and deal with all the reporting requirements thereafter. However, we, we deal with a lot of 
um, self-care and, and FHL businesses that are VAT registered, holiday parks, etc. Um, so I just want to touch on the main changes again in, a, in the COVID context. The first thing that was announced were, was for VAT liabilities that arose between the 20th of March and the 30th of June, they were deferred to the 31st of March 21. Um, however, subsequently they've now changed that again to allow those bills to be settled over a 12 month period, similar to the income tax deferral to the 31st of March 2022, under a time to pay facility, interest free. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of deferrals which businesses could find themselves uh, with a fairly substantial tax bill or bills next year. The government recognised this and um, looked to spread that burden out over, over a year. Um, but again, you're looking at a, against a VAT bill that would have been paid on the 31st of March 20, being settled two years later, um, so quite a significant period of time. The supply of self catering accommodation is, is a standard rate supply for VAT and therefore is applicable at 20% under normal terms. However, um, an announcement in the, in the summer reduced, temporarily reduced the VAT rate on hospitality, hotel and holiday accommodation to 5%. The rationale behind it was to encourage spending in the sector to make things cheaper for the public who at the end of the day, are suffer VAT, and there's no ability for uh, an individual to claim VAT back in a normal context. And the thought was that businesses would um, reduce um, the, the VAT rate to pass on essentially a VAT saving to the customer, which uh, some to some did, but there was no there was no need for that to happen. A lot of businesses um, kept the gross price point the same. Um, and therefore, they were actually able to increase their bottom line by that 15%. And, and there was nothing stopping that. And, and lots of businesses have done it to try and recoup some of the cash that they've lost. Just um, again, a lot of um, smaller businesses run on the flat rate scheme to keep things a little bit simpler, um, whereby a lot of the costs incurred are not available. Um, however, rather than reclaiming the VAT on costs, they just pay a reduced percentage of VAT on their turnover. Previous to the 15th of July, the flat rate percentage for the industry was 10.5%. However, that has been reduced to 0% for the same period up to uh, 31st of March now. So I've put an example there of how that would look. Um, normally, the business would have uh, charged 500 pounds plus VAT for a stay. So as a customer, I'd be paying £600. From the business's point of view, they would have retained £537 because they would have paid 10.5% of the, the £600 to the Batman. However, under the new 0%, they will retain the full £600. So a significant cash um, saving for the, the, the owner. However, it was, a, it was a, just a wee planning point if the business owner, goodness heart, decided to reduce the, the VAT point and to pass on the saving to the customer, as I said there, the customer would now pay £525, which would be £500 plus VAT at 5%. So as a customer, I've, I've saved £75 on my, my holiday. However, the business's point of view, they would have been £12 worse off um, between the 537 they would have kept and the 525 they now have. So you just got to have a bit of um, careful consideration about um, where you're pricing to make sure you're not actually at a disadvantage. Finally, um, from a VAT point of view, just wanted to touch on when they introduced this mechanism for reducing the VAT rate temporarily, there was no anti forestalling provisions provided. Normally, the, the government realised there'll be loopholes to um, take advantage of, I suppose, once they introduce new legislation. However, this wasn't the case because of the speed they had to move at. And the revenue have, have, have come out and agreed to this, whereby there's nothing stopping businesses that are VAT registered to raise an invoice for a stay that will happen after the VAT rate is due to go back up and receive the payment for that at a lower VAT rate now than they would have to charge after the 1st of April when the VAT rate is due to go back up. 
So a very simple example there, a business can rightly charge a thousand pounds plus VAT for a stay that will take place in July 21, when the VAT rate would be 20%, subject to issuing the correct paperwork. So it result in the customer having a cheaper holiday because they'll be paying 5% VAT versus 20%. Um, which could be a significant saving. And we are seeing um, businesses offering these um, advanced payments um, to boost cash flow. Um, so it's something to, to bear in mind and to make sure your software is, is able to handle those advanced bookings. Just quickly, as a time, touch on some of the COVID support that we've we maybe not looked at and how these will be taxable. Self-employed income support grant, which I mentioned at the start, that is taxable as income in the year of receipt. It's effectively turnover. Um, there was two small, there was two business grant funds that were made available um, to the the hospitality and leisure sector. Um, the small business grants fund and um, a larger one, depending on the rateable value, which provided grants of ten thousand or twenty five thousand, and then a subsequent seventy five percent grant for other properties. Those are again taxable as income in the year of receipt. A few of the other schemes, the, the tourism and hospitality enterprise scheme, which was available for companies, and um, closed now. But again, that income taxable in the year of receipt. And we have seen some of our larger um, trading companies that operate in the, the self care and accommodation sector apply for bounce back loans, and you'll have seen them quite heavily advertised. Um, probably a loan of up to £50,000, 25% of turnover. Um, when the money was received, no payments were due by the customer for the first 12 months as the government covered the interest and there was no capital to repay. Thereafter, it was now up to nine years to repay those loans. Um, the attraction for the bounce back was there was no security or personal guarantees required. Um, Actually, that's the slide slightly now out of date. Originally, it was due to close at the end of this month. That's now being extended um, through to next year. Um, so something to bear in mind. And yeah, the, the common phrase, cash is king, has never been more um, important as seen over the last seven months where businesses have been hemorrhaging cash and, and, and returning deposits. Um, the furlough scheme has certainly helped cover off staff costs. But even to shut down a business, there's ongoing costs which will have to be met. Um, and therefore, it is crucial that businesses are keeping up to date management information. As Grant touched on, trying to access any sort of finance, these are more important than ever. Um, and unfortunately, a set of projections prepared one week could be out of date the following week or month because of new schemes or the extension to, to furlough um, access to bounce back loans, etc. So it's really important that um, as, as business owners, you're keeping that information up to date um, and it's as accurate as possible. They will be looking for at least 12 month projections, um, evidence of, of support received, um, working capital management um, on top of other um, finance um, issues, if it's been um, mortgage holidays um, and what the business has been doing. That said, I appreciate there's, there's a lot to take. I've got my world went through. I think just to finish off, what one point to mention um, was it on my slides was that the autumn budget, which was scheduled for normally happens end of November, has been postponed to allow full the government to fully focus on on COVID and the recovery, and therefore we're probably not anticipating a budget until March 21 to confirm the various tax rates and bans for the tax year 21-22. That could throw some issues to the Scottish Government as um, they normally set their budget in February after hearing the UK Government and to know what level of funds are coming our way. So we'll need to see how that plans out. However, we're now in a fixed tax regime up to at least the 31st of March. So if there's tax planning to be undertaken, the advice we're giving to clients now is, is, is act now, where we know what the environment is and the, the various, various reliefs available. Um, delay, which could be right, but it could, in, in the long run, end up being more costly. Um, 
And, and the final point is there's been wild speculation about what the government will do to try and raise the funds to repay all this support. We could be looking at a, a budget deficit of about 400 billion this year. That will have to be repaid. One of the main drivers, and there's a consultation on the go right now, is in relation to capital gains tax and how those may be tweaked or changed to help fund um, the deficit effectively. There's broad consensus in the, in the industry that capital gains tax rates may go up because they're currently between 10 and 20 percent. They may be more aligned to income tax rates, which range up to 46 percent. Um, as well as possibly the abolition of some of the reliefs that are available, and we've already seen restrictions, as I've mentioned, to lettings relief or business asset disposal relief. So I suppose watch this space, but in the context of, of, of businesses, if now is the time that you're looking at doing any capital transactions, best taking advice now, um, as we're working say, in, a, in an environment where rates are known. Um, and looking forward, it's, it's anybody's guess, but more than likely we can see rates going up. That's everything, so thank you for your time. and I'll pass you back to Fiona. Thank you so much, both of you. That's been so valuable. Um, and I think, yeah, the, the, the takeaway again is go speak to your lender, speak to your accountant, make sure that you're ahead of the, ahead of the game rather than chasing after it next year. Um, we've got quite a number of questions, so thank you to everybody that's attending as well. Scott, quickly, can you just explain what you mean by trade in terms of furnished holiday letting? Yes. So there, there, there's a, a distinction between trading businesses and investment businesses, um, and it's a little bit of a grey area when it comes to furnished holiday lets. Um, furnished holiday lets are deemed to be trading for certain taxis, whereby they the, the business offers more services than simply just the provision of the accommodation. Um, there are various tax cases, a legis, um case law, looking at what those services are. I won't go into them in detail here, but subject to meeting those criteria, there's more tax benefits as a trading business than it, there are for a standard letting or investment business. Um, so distinction has to be, to be made and um, discussed with your accountant which side of the line you think the business falls, document the evidence as to why you, you claim to be a trade, the revenue um, are quite aggressively attacking that sector and that badge because of the various reliefs that are available with it. Um, so take time and document your evidence, speak with your accountant to make sure you're happy and more importantly if you are doing a trading business, make sure you're reporting it correctly on your, your annual tax return um, and within the accounts, and it's not going on the wrong pages because I've seen clients that do run FHL businesses, they've reported it incorrectly when they've come to us as clients, and they were excluded from the grants I mentioned earlier, um, where otherwise they could have um, applied. So it's just taking care. Yeah, because we've been dealing with the UK government about the technical exclusion of furnished holiday lettings from any self-employed income support. Um, but are you suggesting that if we have put our income down on the property pages, we are still eligible for that support? No, if it's been on, if it's been on the land and property pages, then, then no. If it's been returned as, as partnership income, if it was run as a partnership and partnership pages, then yes, um, potentially you'd open yourself up to, to qualify. Um, if it was on the self-employment income pages as a trade, um, then yes, there's an argument that you, would, you could qualify for those grants, but not if it's been on the land and property pages. Yeah, that's just been a massive frustration. Well, it's been a massive frustration throughout the whole pandemic that the way you set your business up has had a direct impact on whether or not you could access any of the support, which has just been really difficult to navigate and a, a massive headache. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. There's a couple of questions about capital gains tax, which would be really helpful to just cover. So one person said, if we've spent £750,000 renovating derelict properties to create holiday lets, can that investment be offset against capital gains tax? 
is there a time limit at which um, capital gains tax reduces, as in if we've owned the properties for 20 years? Um, so that, that spend, that 750,000 spend, would form part of the, the base cost for capital gains tax purposes. Only when you ever come to sell that asset, um, you couldn't write the cost off against a capital gain on another asset in, in that year. Um, it forms part of the base cost. So when you come to sell that renovated dwelling, you'll have a minimum of 750 base cost. Um, but it doesn't help against other gains in the year that you've spent that money. It's locked away. Okay, okay. there's another one, quite an interesting one. Is there an argument to move back into a holiday let before selling it to make your make it your main residence? So you don't need to pay capital gains tax and if so how long do you have to move in for sneaky i like it <laughs> yeah yeah that, that was always a, a common tax planning point to when they have a second property that will move in for a few months and claim it as my ppr um as i mentioned in my, my slide the lettings relief element has now gone um so that is quite valuable it was up to forty thousand pounds which at 28% um, could save you know, over £12,000 of tax. However, moving back into an FHL, um, what well, previously an FHL, as your main residence, um, with the view of only selling it um, and claiming PPR, wouldn't really benefit that much um, for, for two reasons. Intention is one. It's all about intention, improving intention. If the intention is purely to move into an FHL, to then sell it in six months, the revenue will try and deny any claim for relief um, for that purpose. The second, principal private residence or, or PPR, the relief for selling your, your house is prorated for when you've occupied it as your PPR. So if you've had an FHL for 10 years, you live in it for six months and then sell it, the whole the whole gain or or nine and a half years worth of the gain would still be exposed to tax um so that isn't a reason to uproot everything to move into a house for six months and change all your details um, that mechanism has been somewhat curtailed okay that's good to know grant one for you the covid forbearance six month holiday is that really not going to be visible on your credit file that is the way I understand it. Um, I can only speak for us personally and how we've dealt with that. And our administration systems um, have been set up so that they don't report to credit reference agencies. Clearly, it's an industry um, thing that they need to, to get all their systems set up correctly. And then there's various different um, credit agencies as well that they're dealing with. So um, it is something the industry needs to get right, clearly. Um, personally, I think we, we're okay with that. Um, and we haven't reported any of the, the COVID forbearance in to our credit reference agency, which is uh, Equifax. You have Experian, you have various other ones as well. Um, so it will be down to the individual organisation to not report in those um, but they've had clear guidelines from the fca that that's what they should do or what they shouldn't do um, so if anybody came across that happening um, the the keeping notes of the communication you've had is important um, and you would always have the financial ombudsman that you could go to to get that rectified if there was any issues and would you suggest approaching a lender just making sure that they haven't put you down on the credit rating just to double check yeah it should be a given and i would have hoped that any financial organization you're dealing with will have confirmed that in in writing to you already um or it should be on on some of the documentation that you've you've dealt with already to confirm that well i know you guys did it because i got the letter so thanks <laughs> <laughs> you talk Talking about going back to sort of normal business forbearance, you talk about evidencing income and evidencing financials. How formal does that need to be going forwards? Um, again, I'm speaking personally for our organisation. Um, I've got to watch what I say here, Scott will give me daggers. 
Um, for us, it is we put a reliance on the, the client to pull the information together. If it's the currency back brilliantly, um, you know, that's brilliant. However, it's not always necessary to have that. And sometimes that data might not be coming through for another 12 to 18 months anyway. So it's it's more the here and now that we're we're probably more interested in than that will be management information. But there's some people out there that maybe run with cloud-based accountancy programs. So print off from that would be absolutely ideal as well. But everyone, each to their own, some people might still work with that paper and pen and a book and um, you know just it's keeping a note of everything that you've got and um, having those discussions and we, we aren't there to, to trip people up it's basically just to try and gather that information as best we can and um, so we will try and work with people the best we can as well brilliant thank you yes and by the way people do indeed work with um paper and pen. When I was administering the £1 million additional grant that we got recently, people were sending in um, evidence of their bookings in diaries. It was amazing. Anyway, um, so, so to, putting COVID aside for the moment, here's a question which is quite interesting. How long does a business have to be trading to be considered for a holiday let mortgage? As in, we've been trading since August 2019 with three rentals and we want to buy a property with 75% loan to value and an easily achievable 145% projection of income versus annual mortgage payments. Could that be considered to be a holiday let mortgage or do they need to have a certain number of years trading? Yeah, we would we would consider that. Um, typically, the what we would ask for is a holiday letting agency to provide a, a forecast for that new property they're looking to purchase. Um, the, the interest covers an interesting point that they make there, about 145%. That's typically an industry-wide metric for buy to let. Um, we would be comfortable to look at 125% cover, and each lender will be different. So that's something worth them investigating just to see, um, you know, that the cover. Great for them if they can hit 145%. That's even better. That gives them more confidence in it, and ultimately that will give the, the lender more confidence as well. And um, so it's letting agents take comp um, confirmation of what that should do over the year, and that that. The way the holiday letting agency can report that might be different. Sometimes they'll give you year one, this is what it should do, and going forward when it's established, this is what it should do. Sometimes they'll give low, mid, high um, tariffs based on what they think it will do as well. So it can come in various different forms. We're quite happy to accept from most letting agents. Um, an odd time, if it's a quite quirky, sort of small agency, we might ask for a second opinion. So maybe a larger agency with a large database sometimes the smaller agencies might only have a small pool of properties that they're, they're taking the projections from but yet again it's, it's similar again the discussion to take place and we would guide them in the best way forward if they come to us at an early stage and um, the other big positive is they've got an existing trading business in the background and um, which they've obviously got experience of trading so that's another big plus for them coming to anybody as well excellent thank you um, Scott, one for you on tax treatment. So, as we all know, um, business interruption insurance um, has not strictly done what they should have done and haven't paid out. But some people use Schofields um, and they did pay out for loss of business during lockdown. Um, what is the tax treatment of those insurance payments? Yeah. Do you declare it as normal rental revenue or as other income or how do we treat them in the 2021 tax year? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, insurance companies, and it's worth just noting, there's actually a big court case on the go right now um, in relation to business or insurers and business interruption insurance and effectively trying not to get out of paying policies. So certainly watch this space if even if you've been declined in the past um, you'll see the outcome of this this court case in uh, over the preceding months and there'll be an option to try and make another claim if you have been successful in making your claim i can't say for every policy because every policy is, is written differently as a general rule um, if the has been if the insurance premiums have been deducted and as a tax deductible expense in, in the business more often than not, the receipt of a payout from that policy, if it's in relation to lost turnover, stock wastage or stock loss, um, they will be treated more, more often than not as taxable income. 
um, and reported essentially as the same as turnover within the, the relevant tax year. Um, if, it's, if it's loss of income, um, that is effectively turnover. Um, the tax treatment is, is the same. Um, if it was a payout for a specific on, a, on an asset or damage to an asset or something like that during lockdown, um, it could be capital in nature uh, and some elements may be tax free. Um, it really comes down to the wording of the policy and the very clear instruction from the insurers when they, they pay out. Um, so I can't give guarantees that everything is taxable as income um, or, or capital, but hopefully um, more often than not, as I say, if it's due to loss of business, turnover down or stock wastage, that will be taxable as income in the relevant pages of the land and property, if that's where you've previously returned your, your rental income. But again, worth talking to your accountant to make sure you're doing the right thing, I assume. Absolutely. Um, have a look through the policy. Um, the policy will have various documentation. And, and quite often, the insurers, when they pay out um, on a policy, it will be specified as to which measure it relates to, um, because you can also have more than one element to a payout. Um, so speak with insurers and, and the accountants um, if you're unsure. But I think a lot of these policies will be income and therefore taxable as such. Okay, that's good to know. Um, again, Scott, sadly, some people are just finding this all too hard. If you're thinking of selling your property let, um, what tax mitigation advice could you give them? Yeah, yes, uh, and it's it's an important point. I mean, I think I, I touched on a little bit with the postponement of the autumn budget and essentially putting forward the, the you know the no immediate changes to the capital tax regime at least up to the 31st of March so if you're in a position of thinking of selling um, or realistically within 12 months of selling the time is probably right now to to start actively pursuing that so at least you know you're selling what regime tax regime you'll be subject to things like making sure property is in the correct ownership is key if if it's husband and wife um, you can equalise ownership quite easily um, and without a tax cost. And then when you come to sell that property, um, you could have two lots of the annual exemption, which is currently 12,300 per person. Um, so if you equalised ownership, you could almost get over £26,000 of gain tax-free versus potentially being taxed at 28%. So that's a very simple measure, but, but worthwhile looking into, making sure you actually go back through your records and pick up all the relevant costs associated with that property or that business that you're looking to dispose of. Quite often, there will be costs that haven't been tax deductible because they're capital improvements. Um, and they can go, there's no time limit. You go right back to when you first owned that property. So it's, it's quite important to keep good records to make sure you finally do get tax relief for the costs, whatever they may be, ex extensions, new boilers that haven't been there or completely renovating the kitchen and it's not been a like for like transaction. So making sure you just dig through the ownership and um, pick up on all those costs. And at the same time, with that restrictions on lettings relief, as I mentioned, and the interaction potentially of principal private residence relief, getting an accurate timeline and ownership history of the property is crucial when you're passing your information to your accountant to work out what tax you may have to pay. We need that timeline from date of ownership to date of sale. Um, and hopefully that's fairly easy to pull together, um, but it can provide a really good tax planning mechanism if there's periods of ownership where there's reliefs that are available. Um, so that's my sort of, sort of three or four main areas to look at. Um, prior to selling. The worst thing from a, an accountant's point of view is getting a phone call from someone saying, oh, I've sold my property uh, and we don't have any history of that property or know how it's been used. Um, and of course, with the 30-day reporting regime, be prepared with all that information in advance of selling um, because failure, failure to submit the relevant return and pay any tax within 30 days will now incur penalties and interest. So be prepared. <laughs> Okay, uh, there's a lot to consider, isn't there? Um, here's a good question. Um, will there be some allowance, do you think, Scott, from HMRC on furnished holiday let thresholds for 2021, as many might struggle to meet 
the 105 days actually get 210 available? That's a really good point. Yeah, um, and it's something I actually was researching yesterday. Um, so to date, there has been no guidance from the revenue on the either relaxation of those um, qualifying criteria, because essentially the first period that will be under reporting will be 2021, which won't um, start until April next year. We're probably not expecting the revenue to announce anything up until maybe March or even potentially into April. Um, just to reiterate, to qualify as an FHL, the property has to be available for let for 210 days and actual let for 105, with no period being over 31 days. Um, with lockdown, obviously a lot of businesses have lost peak season, they, they may not hit that criteria. As an immediate fallback, if it's a historic FHL business, you can make a grace election which allows a year to be treated as, a, as, a, as an FHL qualifying year, even though you don't meet the criteria, as long as the property met the criteria in the previous year. So if the business was an FHL for 1920, you could claim a grace election for the current tax year, 2021, and it would still be FHL status. And you can actually claim a second grace election for the next year, um, again, as long as you've made the election in the first year and it qualified the year before that. So um, that's for established businesses, for a lot of new businesses that have set up an FHL, which um, don't have that one year's history to qualify as. We're waiting to see what the government announce um, in terms of the realisation. My gut instinct would be they'd have to change it somehow, because um, it, otherwise it wouldn't be fair, or allow a, a, a retrospective claim after two years um, that they are then FHL about, but again, watch this space. Okay, yeah, interesting times. Grant, here's an interesting one for you. What would be the attitude to remortgaging a holiday let in Edinburgh Old Town, where there's little forward demand right now, and we all know that licensing is coming our way fast, so that's a, an interesting one for you. Yeah, um, we've probably seen less Inquiries coming in our direction for for urban-based letting units at the moment, and that's primarily, I think, because it's a lot of um, new purchases that we've been looking at at the moment, and not the refinance. If a refinance was to come to us now, it, it would come back to the data again. Where where is the the property being traded? You know, how has it been trading previously? Um, accepted that the bookings will have gone right down over this period of time. Um, however, you've got to look at it with a, um, you know, where is it going to get back to? And Edinburgh, Old Town is always going to be popular. Um, so, as a seasoned lender into this industry, we would be looking at that in a positive way. However, we would be looking for some form of mitigants over this short term period. So, if it was the only income of the owner, um, clearly that's going to throw up some issues. With us feeling comfortable with it, um, we would be looking if there's any other background income streams in place and um, that could support it over the short term period, or potentially take an amount of funds on deposit for a period of time to cover the eventuality that um, we need some additional security over that time. So it wouldn't be a no; it would be an investigating it with them just to see all the details on it and then making a call off the back of that. But ultimately, Edinburgh is still going to be a popular place for people to take um, all the letting or self-catering apartments, probably even more so now that people are getting used to that way of holidaying um, as well, because that's the first sector that returned, really, wasn't it? Before people were comfortable going into the guest house hotels, self-catering was the one that people thought they could go away and keep themselves relatively safe. Um, so, yeah. I, more than happy to, to pick that up with them if they wanted to, to discuss it further. Brilliant, that's fantastic. So you are indeed a, a very seasoned lender to our sector and incredibly valued for that. Do you see the Cumberland remaining in the self-catering sector long term? Yeah, um, we've we've always specialised in hospitality, we've always specialised in, in guest house hotels and self-catering. Self-catering makes up probably 75% of everything we do when it comes to lending and of 
recently, it's probably 90 to 95 percent of what we've been doing. Um, we've taken the conscious decision to, to narrow our offering. Um, we're in the past, we would have done a lot of development, commercial development, residential, retail. Um, we've taken the decision to go fully hospitality, um, and we still think that's the right thing to do. Um, we have a particular niche in that area, and we'll be supporting self-catering you know, long into the future. Amazing. Thank you. I'd like to thank both of you very much indeed. We've got a ton of questions that have come in. So what might be a good idea is if we um, maybe pass those around to you, if you could answer some questions and we can post them online. And again, this whole video will be posted online probably later on today. So you can go back and, and re-watch it if you want to. But that's been so valuable and we've, yeah, my head's bursting. Um, and I probably need to have a conversation with both of you later on today. Um, but thank you very much indeed. Next up on our autumn talk schedule is another one that you really can't afford to miss. It's all about how you can really save money with capital tax allowances and also cleaner EV. Cleaner EV don't just do electrical charging vehicle points. They also can um, give you advice about uh, solar panels and all sorts of other money saving ways. So please do join us on the next one. And in the meantime, uh, it's lunchtime. So thank you very much for attending. And thank you, Scott and Grant. Bye-bye. Thank you.